let us discuss the basic, the physical geometry. So the basic physical geometry of an internal combustion engine. So to do that in this particular segment, I'm going to refer to the lecture slides, uh, lecture one, uh, slides 34 and 35, and lecture two, slides eight to 16. So let me just share the screen so we can watch these slides at the same time. I'm going to be annotating on them. There we go. My annotation tools. Okay. So the basic unit, and again, in a, in a single engine, we, we can have multiple piston cylinder assemblies, right? So the basic unit of, uh, of my, uh, what should I say? The basic unit of the engine is the piston cylinder. And here I'm gonna sketch out in red. So I like to put in dashed red lines. This is the thermodynamic system under consideration. This is basically what we're studying all the way throughout this course. It's this volume of mass that's inside the cylinder and what happens to it as the piston uh, expands the volume and contracts the volume and combustion occurs and intake and exits. So to talk about the basic uh, geometric, uh, well, so the basic geometric uh, um, parameters of the engine, we're gonna talk, there's a few components here. So we have, so this is in dashed red is our thermodynamic system. The outside here, this is our cylinder. I think this is not noted. So this is the actual We'll call this the cylinder or the cylinder wall. There you go, it's written out of here. And here we have the piston, so shaded or hatched here. This is our actual piston, which moves up and down throughout the motion. Um, the bore, here boxed in, boxed in red here. The bore is really the diameters. So we call it, uh, yeah, the bore is the physical diameter of the cylinder. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a length. So the diameter, diameter of cylinder, it's a length. Um, we name it the bore, but it's really the, the same, they're synonyms. There is, again, this is, here's our top center or top dead center, TC. There's our bottom center, BC, or bottom dead center, BDC. These are the uppermost. So upper, we always think of the, the, the piston that's sitting on the bottom, and then the cylinder head, right? The top of the, of the cylinder here, this we call the cylinder head. So we think of the cylinder head as being on top, so that the top center position is the uppermost position of the piston. And that's regardless of the orientation of the engine, right? If the engine sits upside down or on the side, uh, we don't often see engines with the pistons upside down. Uh, actually, we, we sometimes do, but we often do see pistons at an angle or on their side. So the, the piston head always sort of sits uh, uh, on top of, uh, of our cylinder and the piston moves up towards the piston head and down towards away from the piston head. So the top center and the bottom center, those define the extrema of uh, motion. The distance between the two is the stroke, and we'll often use the letter L, so capital L for the stroke. This is, it's a length, and it's the distance of movement of the piston. The bore, we use the letter B, like this. Um, let's see, we have the, let's see if there's something written. So the crankshaft angle. Okay, so here's our connecting rod. So this piece here is the connecting rod. Uh, we'll often use a little, this has a length and that length actually does have an impact on the dynamics of the engine. We'll often call that little L. And the distance here between the rotational axis of uh, the output of the engine and the connection between the connecting rod and that axis, this is the crank arm. So this is the crank arm length. We'll use A. This is also a length. Um, let's see. And it's not in this particular case. It's drawn. So if it's a single piston, it would be a physical. It would be a physical link, right? It's this on the back there, on the back of the connecting rod. Although in multi-cylinder configuration, it's really like your your. You can think of it's not actually built as a single piece, but your you're rotating, um, you're rotating shaft, I draw the end, 
the rotating shaft that goes through the engine is sort of sort of shaped like this. So here we'd have a two. So here we would have a, a two piston setup where one connecting rod attaches over here, one connecting rod attaches over there. And the crank arm is sort of sort of virtual, but there's a there's an offset between here, the axis of rotation. And the axis of or the the, the connecting point between the connecting with the connecting rod. And that distance is A. That would be the crank arm length. Uh, we think of so time in um, in an internal combustion engine is I'm going to say not that important. Well, it, it's extremely important, but uh, the the sequence of events that happens in internal combustion engines it's really timed with position, right? It's the the piston when the piston is at the top. This is when we're most compressed. This is when combustion will start, or will around the, this point combustion will occur, and it will push the piston down. When the piston is at the bottom, this is when the exhaust valve opens so that we can push uh, the combustion products out. So it's really position that is a measure of, uh, that's a measure of the, the um, it's really position that's a measure of the timing of events. And we'll measure that position in the rotational frame. So we'll take the, the crank arm or we'll take the rotation axis. We're going to draw, so here we have our zero degree reference straight on top. And then we're going to look at how far is that connecting point, and that's our angle theta. So this particular piece of a sketch is reproduced over here, right? So this is the, this is our our piston. Piston is up here, and this is the connecting. Or that's the, the connecting direction with the connecting rod. So the connecting rod points here. This is our distance a. And here, let me just erase a couple of just to get a little bit more room. And then we have the connecting rod like this. There we go. So when the crank arm, the connecting rod are lined up or collinear like this, but in, in not superposed, then the piston is all the way up. That's the top center position. And when it's at the bottom, they are again collinear, but they are superposed and that's the bottom dead center. So here's the bottom dead center, top dead center. Uh, and that's it. Let's see, yes, and that circle is the motion of that connecting point that is described. So now theta is sort of our, well, it's our unit of position, but we'll often use theta as a unit of time as well. Okay, let's move up one slide. There we go, to keep talking. Oh, here I'm going to erase my annotations. There we go. So now we've talked about oh, they're all drawings. There we go. So now we've uh, we've defined sort of basic lengths. We've defined the bore. We have defined the stroke, which is the amount of movement of the piston. Now we can define volumes. So when the piston is all the way to the top, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of volume left at the top. This is what we call the clearance volume. This is what the piston comes and it clears the head by a certain amount. So that clearance volume, that is the smallest volume throughout the cycle. And we have the, let's see, we have the total, well, it's the smallest volume. I should say we could also call this, this is the top dead center volume. And I'll often use the letters V with TDC or VTC. This is the clearance volume or just VC for the clearance volume. So I'm going to use all of these uh, different sort of different ways of writing them throughout the course. When the piston is all the way at the bottom, then we have the largest volume. So all of that volume, this is the largest volume attainable, which is the bottom dead center volume. So this is VBDC or VBC. Uh, that's it. Yep. There's not really another variable that I'm going to use. There is another volume, which is called the displacement volume. That's the volume that's added throughout the motion of the piston. It's equal to this volume over here. 
So the displacement volume is equal to the, the largest volume minus, so the total volume of the piston is at the bottom, minus the clearance volume, minus V TDC, like this. And this displacement volume is what is normally uh, reported. So when you go in and if you go and shop for a car or shop for an engine, if you get a 1.5 liter engine, that means that's the displacement volume of the engine. It's not the total volume, it's how much it, it, the piston clears as it moves up and down. Typically, so typically it's reported for, uh, for the whole engine. So if you look up a specification seat of a, of a motor and it says displacement volume two liters and there's four pistons, then that means that each piston, so I, I like to note this as, for example, VE volume of the engine, that is the total displacement volume would be, for example, two liters. And I'll use NP is equal to four. Let's say there's four pistons. Then VD is equal to VE over NP is equal to two over four is 0 0.5 liters per piston. I try to be very consistent with this, but it's, it's not, nobody, it, it's not customary to be that consistent. You sort of just have to pick it up from context. If people are talking about the volume of the entire engine or the volume of a single cylinder. Uh, so stroke is the amount of vertical travel. We can compute the displacement volume as it's shown here uh, by the, just a physical motion of the piston. The piston moves in a linear fashion. So it sweeps actually a cylindrical area. So it's uh, in this case is, so here we've put D really, at, I prefer, I would prefer to put VD, the displacement volume is equal to the stroke times pi and the bore B squared over four. So pi B squared over four, that is the area of the piston. So the displacement volume is just the, it's the area or it's the volume of a right cylinder. Cylinder. So VD is equal to pi B squared over four times L. There we go. So now that's the extrema. That's how much the piston clears as it moves from the beginning, beginning point, there's no beginning and end, it's a cycle, but the topmost point to the bottommost point. Now what happens in between? So I'm gonna jump, here we clear the drawings. I'm just going to jump to a different set of slides. It's gonna be uh, this deck of slides called lecture two. Here, there we go. So let me bring back my, oh, let me make this a little bit smaller so we can see the entire slides. There we go. There we go. So, oh, clear out the drawings. Okay. So now we want to know what happens. So we, we have related the volume. So we've related the displacement volume to the physical size of the piston, right? A piston is a, it's a puck. It's a round puck. And it's got a, a it's got a certain diameter that sweeps an, an area of the piston. Um, and note that we are um, I'm assuming, or I'm always drawing in these images, um, the shape of the piston as being flat, right? What we call the the topmost here. This is the piston crown. I keep drawing this as a flat. It is most likely in modern engines, it's actually a shape. I mean, there's could be shaped like this, but it doesn't really matter for the displacement volume, right? It just means that I have a, a, a cylinder that has sort of like some kind of depression on the top, but then it's a it's still a right cylinder that comes down. And then I at the bottom, I have the same shape at the bottom. Like this. So it doesn't matter whether the top is shaped or not. As it sweeps the cylinder, it gives me the exact, uh, the exact same volume. So the displacement volume actually is exactly the volume of a right cylinder. Okay. So now we've replaced, we've we've linked the displacement volume with the physical 
size of the engines, right, with the bore and the length. But now I want to know what happens with volume throughout the cycle. So I want to know what's the, so actually what we would call the instantaneous volume. So this equation here, which we're going to derive, is the instantaneous volume. So now we're going to do a little bit of trigonometry to essentially write this variable s. So we have the, let's see, so we have the connecting rod has a length l, lowercase l, and we have the crank arm has a length a. And now we want to know what's the distance between these two points, between the attachment point of um, the attachment point of the connecting rod to the piston and the axis of rotation. So at top, we know what the limits are. At top dead center, S is equal to L plus A. And at bottom dead center, S, actually here we can, I can use my angles. So S of 180 degrees is equal to L minus A. Because at that point, A points straight down and then L points back up here. So the distance between these two points then becomes the total L minus A at the bottom. And here, let me just rewrite this S of, this is S of zero degrees is equal to L plus A. This is a top dead center. Okay. But now I want to know what's the actual function S of theta. So we're going to do a little bit of trigonometry. So I'm going to split my distance S into two lengths. I'm going to split it here with the vertical so that I have one square angle here, one square angle there. So this, I'm going to call this S1. I'm going to call this S2. This here is our angle theta. So we know that S2 is equal to by the triangles. This is, I know the angle theta. This, uh, that's, well, that's a variable that I'm interested in. The hypotenuse is A, so that means S2 has to be equal to, let's see, the sine is opposite, so cos is adjacent over hypotenuse, so this would be, sorry, I'm blanking out there. So S2 would be equal to, let's see, A cos theta. I'm gonna call this, the vertical, I'm going to call this X because I don't use it. I'm going to get rid of X afterwards anyway. And so the value of X is equal to A sine theta. Okay. So now I have two lengths of the upper triangle. So I know that S1 squared is going to be equal to L squared plus, oh, sorry, other way around. I know that L squared, the hypotenuse, is going to be equal to S1 squared plus X squared. So I know that S1 then is going to be equal to L squared minus X squared to the one half. So S1 is going to be equal to L squared. That's a geometry of, that's, a, that's part of the geometry of the piston. Minus X squared. Well, X I know is A sine theta. So I'm going to square this so minus A squared sine squared theta, all of that to the one half. And now I have my full function. So now I know that S of theta is going to be equal to S1 of theta plus S2 of theta. So that S is equal to S of theta is equal to S1 we said is, or did I write it down? Uh, S1 is L squared. Oh, let me write it backwards just so it matches on this slide. So S2 of theta is going to be A cos theta plus S1 is going to be is L squared minus A squared sine squared theta to the one half. Okay, that's our length S of theta. There we go. So now we have this is our, our well, you'll see, this is our sort of our, 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 uh, generating functions for everything that's of interest. I don't actually care about what that distance is. I mean, I don't really care about the, the uh, at least from a, from a, a thermodynamic sense. I don't care that much about what the distance is between the axis of rotation and the piston itself. What I really care about is the volume. So this is why here we're defining 
y. So y is equal to zero is when the piston is all the way at the top and y increases as it goes down. So I know that the volume of the piston, so here we've rederived this function here. So now I can, I'm going to, and that function is the same as this boxed in function there. So let me just clear all of my drawings and then we're going to restart. So now starting from y, this is y is equal to zero is the position of the piston at the top dead center. Um, let's see, so I know that the volume of the piston, uh, sorry, the volume of the cylinder is going to be equal to the clearance volume on top plus the area of the piston times y. This is the plane area, the plane area of the piston as it moves down. So this AP is uh, pi B squared over four. So this is equal to VC plus pi B squared over four times Y. Okay, what's our distance Y? Um, I'm just gonna make a, a slight vertical shift. So Y is equal to zero is equal to the position of the piston at top dead center. And at that position, my connecting point is gonna be somewhere over here. So I can define the distance Y as the distance from the top of the piston at top dead center to the current location of the top of the piston. So this would be my distance Y, or I can just shift it to the position of the connecting point at top dead center to the current position of the connecting point. And because the piston is a solid element, there's no slop in how the connecting rod attaches, these two distances have to be the same. So Y is then by definition L plus A, the position at top dead center, minus S of theta. This is my function Y of theta. There we go, that's it. We can replace it in. So the volume of the cylinder as a function of theta is equal to the clearance volume plus pi b squared over four, and then brackets, we have L plus A minus S. So minus A cos theta, and replace everything, uh, minus L squared minus A squared sine squared theta to the one half, close brackets, there we go. And this is this equation over here. So that's the instantaneous, instantaneous volume. Let's just check if we get it right. So when um, when theta is equal to zero degrees at top dead center, then sine of zero is zero. Uh, so this bracket here becomes, let's see, the round bracket, this becomes uh, L squared minus zero. So this is L squared to the one half. So this is just minus L. So I'm gonna get an L minus L that's gonna go away. And at zero, cos of zero is one. I'm gonna get an A minus A this is also zero, so this whole thing is zero. So we get that the volume of the cylinder at zero degrees is equal to the clearance volume. And then the theta is at 180 degrees. Uh, let's see, at 180 degrees, cosine of theta is gonna be negative one. So cos of theta is gonna be, goes from one to negative one. Uh, so that is now, let's see, plus a, so I'm gonna get a plus a, that is two a. And sine of 180 is still zero, so I'm gonna get an L squared to the one half, that's an L, so I get L minus L, this is zero, plus a plus a, so two a. So the volume of the cylinder at 180 degrees is equal to the clearance volume plus pi b squared over four times two a. Well, what is 2a? 2a is the diameter of this circle here. Two a. And by definition, that's the it results in a translation. So when we've we've turned, so if this is my connecting rod on top and my a, my crank arm on the bottom, when I go from the top position to the bottom position, 
it goes like this. What I've done is I've brought the cylinder down by a length L, which is actually equal to 2A. So by definition, 2A actually is equal to L. So this is equal to the clearance volume plus pi B squared L over four, which is the displacement volume. This is VBDC. Good. So our function here works perfectly. At least it reproduces the top and bottom points. Um, we can rewrite that equation in a slightly more uh, convenient form. Yeah, let's rewrite this as a slightly more convenient form. So here I'm going to clear all these drawings. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to stop the share. I'm just going to bring out going to bring out a whiteboard. All right, so our instantaneous volume V of theta was equal to the clearance volume plus, I'm just rewriting the equation we derived, pi B squared over four times L plus A minus S. So minus A cos theta minus L squared minus A squared sine theta, sine squared theta to the one half. I'm gonna turn this into a square bracket, okay. Let's see. Well, I know that the displacement volume uh, is an important is an important quantity, and it's a it's a it's a quantity that I I always want to track, or it's sort of a defining quantity of my engine. It tells me how big my engine or how big my cylinder actually is. So here I'm going to multiply the top here by big L. So this becomes a displacement volume. I'm going to divide this whole thing by L like this. So now I have the instantaneous volume is equal to VC plus pi B squared L over four. This is VD. And now in here, now this is a, let's see, this is uh, L. Well, L is equal to 2A. So let me replace this by 2A. So it's gonna be an L plus A minus A cos theta minus L squared minus A squared sine squared theta to the one half divided by 2A. It turns out the two is not gonna be all that interesting inside this bracket. So I'm just gonna bring it out in front. I'll keep an A. All right, this is awesome. So now I can, I can distribute this A inside each one of these terms and get yet another extra ratio. So V of theta is equal to VC plus one half of the displacement volume, L over A, we'll call this this, uh, this big ratio R. That's a geometric ratio. So a really high value of R means a really long connecting rod and a tiny crank arm. Piston moves just a little bit, but it's very far from uh, from the axis of rotation. And then a really low value of R means that the connecting rod is close to the length of the uh, crank arm. Uh, and it has, to be, it has to be greater because if it's less than the connecting arm, then it would, like the connecting arm with the crank arm would actually like hit inside the cylinder or the piston. So that can't, that can't happen. So R closer to one means it's very, very close. So I'm gonna get a big R plus A over A is one minus A divided by A minus cos theta minus the A goes inside. It's gonna become an A squared. I'm gonna get an R squared minus sine squared theta to the one half like this. Okay. Um, still not. Well, it's not great, so I've got this clearance volume. Let me just non-dimensionalize. I'm a scientist. I like to non-dimensionalize things. So I'm just going to divide by the clearance volume. That's equal to. So now I'm going to get a VC divided by VC. It's going to be 1 plus 1 half VD by VC. R plus 1 minus cos theta 
minus r squared minus sine squared theta to the one half. And vd by vc, well, the displacement volume is equal to bottom dead center minus vc over vc. So the bottom dead center over the clearance volume, that's equal to the compression ratio. Yeah, that's the large volume over the small volume, minus one. So we get V of theta over VC is equal to one plus a half of the compression ratio minus one, multiplied by R plus one minus cos theta minus R squared minus sine squared theta to the one half. Awesome. Okay, so how does this look? This is a, a, let's see. So this gives me a, well, this is one plus a bunch of constants multiplied by essentially a, a sinusoidal function. Actually here, I'm gonna bring back my, I'm going to bring back my, um, my slides. Let me just switch shares for a moment because this is actually already plotted inside inside our slides. There we go. And this is what the volume looks like. So essentially we start at, this is the clearance volume. Uh, this is plotted for a specific example of, uh, let's see, B is equal to 14 inches. So this is a huge piston. This is a, a this is a, the diameter of my piston is larger than this. It's like, it's like twice my head. This is a huge piston that moves up and down. So it's 14 inches and it's got a stroke of 14 inches. This is what we call a square piston. The stroke is equal to the bore. And so this big piston moves up and down by 14 inches. It has a compression ratio of nine and big R there is equal to six. And so if you plug all of this in, you goes from the uh, compression or the, the clearance volume and then as the piston moves down, initially there is no, because initially the, the, the velocity of the piston at the top is zero, right? When the, when the crank arm moves like this, the piston doesn't move up and down. So initially there is no, this is why this is uh, flat at the bottom. There's no change in volume. And then as the piston moves down or as the, as the crank arm moves off to the side, the piston moves faster and faster until when the, the crank arm is on its side, then the piston is moving as fast as possible. So then the rate of change of volume is as fast as possible. And then we get to the bottom dead center volume. And again, when the crank arm is at the bottom, there is no change in volume. Hence the top of this curve is flat. And then it zoom, it goes back up. Huh, so actually this is interesting. Um, well, A, we see, this, we see this curve. It looks like a sine wave, it's a, or a, sine, uh, a sine function. It's not quite a sine function. It's a little bit more complicated than this. Um, here's the top dead center at the top. And this applies to both. If it's a, a four stroke or two stroke engine, we get the same, uh, the same kind of behavior. Um, what's interesting is that I've, I've said that the, I've actually equated in my speech, I've equated the velocity of the piston with the rate of change of volume, uh, which is actually true. This is, these two things are equitable. So we can actually write what the velocity of the piston is. Well, because we have its position, we have its its change of position with, uh, well, with theta. So actually this is V of theta. So this is the rate of change of volume for each unit angle of crank arm change, right? So for each degree of crank arm turning at the top, there's very little change in the volume. And on the side, each degree of turning of the crank arm leads to a very, a relatively large change in volume. And again, at the bottom, every degree of movement of the crank arm leads to, at bottom center, no change in volume. Well, if there's no change in volume, that means that there's no change in Y position of the piston. That means that there's no velocity. So I expect the velocity to be zero at the top. The piston is going to accelerate as the crank arm is turning, and then it's going to move as fast as possible in the middle, and then it's going to slow down again. And at the bottom, it's going to be zero, and then it starts again. So it goes zzz. So it speeds up to the middle of the stroke. Well, let's actually, we have the, oh, we have the area in between. Let me keep this for, for 
a little bit later, we're going to write what the, the, the velocity of the piston is uh, first. We'll come back to the area afterwards. That's a pretty easy one. Um, so let's see the piston speed. Well, I'm just going to annotate it on here. So we have the position of the top of the piston with respect to our fixed position, y is equal to zero. And we've said that we've written before y is equal to L plus A, both constants, minus S of theta. So the velocity of the, the velocity of the piston, by definition here, is just dy dt. So this here is a you know, put little triangles, so it's not ambiguous. So by definition, the velocity of the piston is, in fact, dy dt. So we just differentiate this function y dl dt, l is a constant, is 0. da dt is 0. I get minus ds dt, like this. And this is now velocities with respect to time. Right? It has to be in meters per second. But s is a function of theta. So we apply the chain rule. That means that ds dt is equal to ds d theta d theta dt. And you can think of it as these two would cancel out. And then we have ds dt that pops out. Okay, well, this d theta dt, that's the rotational speed. That's the rotational speed of the crank arm. This is equal to, we like to call it omega. This is a rotational speed. When you drive your car, you get the tachometer. It tells you the engine is going at 2,000 RPM, 800 RPM, 4,000 RPM. If you step on the gas. That are, that's the RPM. Omega is, well, this is the rotational speed, which normally we count in radians per second. Um, but we often report it as RPM, which is, let's see. So the rotational speed of the crankshaft, we like to use N. This is the number of rotations per time. So N is equal to 2 pi radians times omega. 2 pi, nope, sorry, other way around. It's n is the number of revolutions per time multiplied by 2 pi radians per revolution. So radians per revolution, revolution per time gives me omega in radians per second. So now we just need to figure out what ds d theta is. Uh, what we had before here, let me just let me just scroll, whoops, let me just scroll up so we can remember what S was. We've written S before. It's A cos theta plus L squared minus A squared times squared theta to the one half. Okay. So let's go in. Oh, there we go. So let's go in and differentiate our S. So we've said before S of theta is L minus a cos theta, uh, hold on, plus we have L squared minus a squared sine squared theta to the one half. Let me just go and make sure again that I've copied this correctly. Oh, there is no L at the beginning. There, it's just a cos theta plus L squared minus A squared sine squared theta to the one half. Okay. So we're gonna come down right there. There we go. All right. So our DS D theta is equal to, uh, let's see, A cos theta, well, the Derivative of sine is cos, and cos is minus sine. So this is going to be minus a sine theta plus, and then I want to differentiate the, the square root term. I'm going to get a one half L squared minus a squared sine squared theta, one half minus one to the minus one half multiplied by, put on the bottom there, the derivative of the stuff inside. So L squared is going to be, it's a constant. So this goes out. And getting minus a squared, and then the derivative of sine squared theta is going to be two sine theta cos theta, like that. So 
So ds d theta, here let me put a minus sign in front, it's going to be equal to, uh, so we get rid of that minus here, so it's going to be a sine theta, and actually I've got it a sine theta over here as well. Well, it's an a sine theta plus, so there's a one half and there's a two, this minus sine is going to go away. So it's going to be a squared sine theta cos theta divided by the square root of L squared minus a squared sine squared theta. Okay, so it's starting to look a lot like uh, our equation there. So we have to we have to massage it a little bit more. Actually, here let's just uh, let's. Eh, this is okay. So a sine okay. So a sine theta. So I'm going to pull out an a sine theta. So actually, here let me rewrite up is equal to. We said it's two pi. N, instead of having omega, so we're going to put 2 pi n, 2 pi n, and then I'm going to mul multiply by everything. I'm going to have an a sine theta plus, uh, I just want to make sure I get back to the equation we had there, and I'm, I'm just juggling between different steps. I'm going to pull an a sine theta out. I'm going to multiply by a sine theta theta, so that inside the first term is just 1 plus, and I've got an a sine theta I took out, so it's going to become a cos theta divided by the square root of L squared minus a squared sine squared theta, like this. Okay, well, 2a is the stroke, so up is equal to pi times L, the stroke, times n, multiplied by sine theta, and then in brackets, it's going to be 1 plus, I'm going to take the A, I'm going to bring it to the bottom. It's going to become a 1 over A in front. And then I'm going to bring it into the square root. So this is going to be all divided by A squared. So it becomes cos theta divided by the square root of L squared over A squared is big R squared minus 1 minus sine squared theta. There we go. And now that's this equation here. We have the cos theta over square root of r squared minus sine squared theta plus one, and it's all multiplied by pi l n sine theta. Awesome. And now that's our velocity. That is our instantaneous velocity. Here, let me make it explicit. This is our instantaneous velocity up of theta is equal to this. There's a, uh, there's a really important quantity, which is the average velocity. So what would be the average velocity of the piston? There's two ways of getting this. Um, one is I could integrate the velocity over time and then divide by the amount of time that it takes. You know, so like up average is going to be the integral from zero to some amount of time tau. Yeah, U, P, D, T, and then divide by 1 over tau. That gives me the average velocity, blah, blah, blah. It's annoying to integrate this thing. There's an easier way of doing this. Um, what is the total distance traveled by the piston over one back and forth? Right, It travels L down, and it travels L up. So over one, over two strokes, or over one rotation of the crankshaft, the piston goes whoosh, whoosh. So over one rotation, the piston over one revolution, uh, let's see, the distance traveled is 2L, two stroke lengths. The time it takes, the time for one, uh, rotation that's just one over n right remember n is the rpm it's a number of well rpm would be rotations per or revolutions per minute um 
but uh, we can, it's, it's per time, right? So it's like RPT, it's revolutions per time, whether it's per minute or per second or however you want to count it. So N is a number, it's the number of revolutions that you do in one second, because that's usually a big number, right? It's like 60, in seconds, it's like 60 cycles per second, 100 cycles per second. In RPM, it's like 2,000 revolutions per minute, 5,000 revolutions per minute. That's sort of typical for uh, the types of engines that we're looking at. So one over N is the number of seconds per revolution, which is one over N. So then the average, so the average velocity is then the total distance traveled in one revolution divided by the time it takes for one revolution. So it's just two L N, there you go. So you could have carried out the whole integral of UP of theta as a function of theta divided by blah, blah, blah. Or you just look at the total distance travel it's an easy, it's an easy value that we know, two L and multiply by the number of revolutions per time. There we go. Um, that's it. This is so actually if we if we scroll down, I bet we have afterwards. Yep, yeah, look at that. We have the average velocity UP bar is 2LN. So a good way to scale our here, I'm gonna annotate again. So a good way to scale the same way that we we scale the instantaneous volume by the clearance volume. Uh, a convenient way to scale the instantaneous velocity. I'm going to make this explicit. It's up of theta. This is a function of theta. This is the instantaneous velocity. I'm going to divide by the average velocity. That just becomes uh, a neat function. So pi over two sine theta, L over A here. This is our big R. There we go. That's it. And that's the velocity of the piston. So why is the average piston speed so important? It's because everything scales, a lot of things scale with the piston velocity. That's what this note is saying here. So the stresses inside the engine scales with, uh, with the piston velocity. If you're, if you're gonna, the faster, the faster that you, you run the engine, the more stress you put on the casing and on the parts and everything. So that there's sort of a, a there's not an actual limit in terms of RPM, or I would say there's not a universal limit in terms of RPM. For example, if you've ever looked at plane engines, so uh, and not actual planes, but motor, uh, motor uh, uh, model planes. So if you look at uh, fuel powered model airplanes, the engines are tiny. They're like, they're like single cylinder, they're like this big, they're really small things. And they will run at like 12,000 RPM. If you take my Subaru and then you try to run this around the corner and, and rev it up to 12,000 RPM, the whole thing will just stop. It, it's not gonna be happy. The, the block will not, will, will explode. So there's somebody who's not gonna be very happy if you run this at 12,000 RPM. Um, Formula One car, they do rev up to like 12, 13,000 RPM. So there's not a universal like max RPM that is good for any internal combustion engine. Um, but there is, a mostly universal rule of thumb that your average piston speed shouldn't be much more than like eight to 15 meters per second. Above that, you're, you're gonna limit, you're gonna be limited by the, the, um, the, the stress capacity of the material itself. So however you design your engine, you want the average piston speed to be around this, uh, around this range. Um, let's see. Yep, in the in the same way, like if you make if you look at, for example, large diesel engines in boats, they run really slowly. They're not running at six thousand RPM. Uh, they're running much slower than that. I don't have the number in my head right now. We'd have to uh, I'd have to search for it in some spec sheets. But the RPM is much lower. So I was looking at, for example, a generator that was running off of a diesel engine, and these ones were actually these ones were relatively uh, similar to a car engine. They were running about eighteen hundred RPM. But that was their operational range. Like they never would run much faster than this. They would hover around 1800 RPM and that's their design speed. And so they probably designed them so that around 1800 RPM, you are nearing eight, nine or 10 meters per second uh, average piston speeds. So the bigger the piston, the longer, the longer the travel of the piston. And if the travel is longer, well, you can't take as many revolutions per time because that will up your that will increase your average 
speed. So the increase in, in stroke length is going to increase your average speed. So you have to bring down your RPM. By the same way, if your 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 stroke is very small, then your it's physically small, then you can you can turn at much higher speeds. Okay. Um, let me clear all the drawings. So let's just see what we have in the slide. So here we have um, oh one example. Person, oh, before we do the example here, I'm going to go back and cover these two slides here. So we've defined instantaneous volume, instantaneous velocity. Here we also have the cylinder area. This is actually going to be very important for our heat transfer calculations in the class. Um, and so for the heat transfer, so the heat transfer is going to go like the, the area of the piston. So the instantaneous area is equal to ACH. So the area of the cylinder head, this is this area here. And note, yeah, in this case, we've drawn it as a flat, but this is not true. It's, it's usually shaped. AP, the area of the piston crown or the piston surface over here. Those two are constant. So those are the lateral areas. Actually, the, the area of the cylinder head will go all the way up to here. We're going to take the sides of the clearance volume. And then we have this part of the area, which is the area of the side of, uh, of a right cylinder, which is just the diameter, uh, sorry, the circumference, pi times the diameter. So pi times the bore multiplied by the increase in uh, side area. L plus A minus S, same function as before. Um, that's it. So our S is equal to this, the same function as before. We shove everything in and then we do a similar, in this case, we do a similar uh, um, non-dimensionalization, except we don't quite carry it through because we keep these two constant in the front. And then we have pi B uh, A is going to be L over two and so on. And then we have our big geometric ratio R as before. And this is the same variation. So as noted here, this is the same variation as the cylinder volume. Um, there is one note in this deck of slides. I'm just going to go through in the next page. My way of dealing with this, um, with this conversion is to just keep units along for the ride all the time. Um, I've said before, so the, so everything scales like the velocity scales with omega, right? It's d theta dt. And often we have n in terms of RPM, revolutions per minute. And we're going to want to connect those two things together. So omega is equal to RPM. So I just, I actually write these, these units all the time. So I would, I will often, you'll often see me writing or you may see me write, you know, omega is equal to 2,000 rev revolutions per minute. Um, and then I'm going to multiply. So one revolution is 2 pi radians per revolution. And one minute is 60 seconds. The revolutions are going to cancel out. So omega is equal to 2,000 times 2 pi over 60. That is going to be the, here, let me punch it in. So we have the answer. So 2,000 times 2 times pi over 60. That's a rotational speed of 209.44 radians per second. There you go. And now that's a rotational speed in a unit that our, um, that our functions will actually accept. And this is what the the this is what this slide is giving you. It's basically just that revolutions. So, but my takeaway is that always write down all of the units, and then you'll be okay. Okay, so let's go back to our example. Let's see. There we go. So we have a four-cylinder, two-liter engine. Oh, so a whoop, clear all drawings. Okay, so we have a four cylinder. All right, number of pistons is equal to four. It's a two liter engine. The total displacement volume of the engine is two liters, and it has a square aspect ratio. The bore is equal to the length, the stroke. 
what should the maximum engine rotational speed be? All right. Well, uh, so the maximum rotational speed, so basically this question we can translate for, what is N if U P bar is equal to uh, eight to 15 meters per second. And actually a four cylinder two liter engine, that's like my car actually. So, so this should be whatever, whatever N, what is N max. So whatever N we get that should look like, that should look like, you know, five to 7,000 RPM. Cause that's basically, that's basically my car. That's basically my Subaru is like two liter or two and a half liter four piston engine. So this, this is roughly the car I have. Okay, so let's see if this works out. Um, well, we know that U P bar is equal to two L N, and this has to be less than eight to 15 meters per second. So we're looking for, I'm gonna put a max. So remember, this is the maximum rotational speed if we apply this condition. Okay, because this is U P max. All right, so what's the stroke? Well, I know that VD is equal to pi B squared over four L. Uh, I don't know B and I don't know L, but I know that B is equal to L. So in this particular case, it's gonna be pi L squared times L, L cubed over four. And it's equal to the displacement, but now I have to be careful, there's four pistons. So it's the displacement volume of one piston, so volume of the engine divided by the number of piston so it's equal to two liters over four. Uh, good. One liter, well, one meter cubed is a thousand liters. So this is 0 0.002 meter cubed over four. There we go. All right. So L is going to be equal to the fours are going to cancel out. So it's going to be actually here. Let me just rewrite it in units. going to be four VE over NP divided by pi to the one third. So this is four times 0 0.002 meter cubed over four pistons times pi to the one third is equal to, let me punch that in, I haven't worked out the answer. So 0 0.00, oops, four times 0 0.002. Here I'm just typing into a calculator. Uh, oh, I actually didn't even need do this divided by four divided by pi, so 3.14 and to the one third. Where's my, there you go, one third. I get 0 0.086 blah, blah, blah meters. Um, okay. So N max is going to be equal to U P bar max over 2L. I'm just turning this equation around. Um, so that means 8 to 15 meters per second divided by 2 times 0 0.086 meters. Yeah, so the stroke is 8.6 centimeters, which makes sense. It's about this long. That's about the size. That's, yeah, that's like the size of the block. That's the size of the engine block. Okay. So that means my N max is gonna be in the range of uh, eight over two divided by 0 0.086. This is in meters, this is one over second. So this is in, so the L is in meters, but it's actually meters per revolution. So N max is gonna be equal to something like 46.51 revs per second to 15 divided by 2 divided by 0 0.086, 87.21 revs per second. I want to get a, a more reasonable number in revolutions per minute. So it's 60 seconds in one minute. So if I multiply that by 60, indeed, I get 5,233 revolutions per minute. And 46.51 tells me 2800, 2791 RPM. So it actually is, yep. It's looking roughly, roughly correct. When I look in the car, yeah, 5200 RPM, my car starts to not be happy. 
and then it, it tries to shift down to not hit that limit or tries to limit the amount of uh, the amount of fuel that I can inject in. Awesome. Well, just clear out everything that I've written there. There we go. Um, one interesting. So there's there's a, a from the piston. Uh, so from the piston position, uh, let's see. From the piston position S, we managed to get the piston velocity. Uh, u, which is ds, essentially is minus ds dt, right? It's, uh, yeah, which is, uh, so that is the velocity at which the piston moves. So we can get the piston acceleration. So here's s, this is the position, the, the position of the place, the piston or the displacement. So when we differentiate that, so actually, yeah, so here we've replaced theta, the angle with omega t to get the rotational speed. Omega is like m. So then we actually, we in this particular case, we substitute because the we they want to express the, the square root as a power series. But the whole, so the interesting part of this whole derivation is that at the end, we are getting d2s dt squared, that is the acceleration of the piston as a function of, oh, look at that. Omega, that's the rotational speed. And acceleration is one of the important components of shaking. This gives you the vibrations. Um, so that means that if my, well, if my piston rotates at well, 1000 RPM, then there has to be some kind of vibrations at around 1000 RPM that is set up in my piston. Like that's what this cos omega T says, right? Because every, every minute, this, this piston is moving up and down a thousand times. But it also creates a harmonic at, whoops, sorry, let me get the two, at twice, at a higher frequency, at twice the frequency, um, which is actually a, a function of this R ratio. This is one over big R. So if big R is close to one, I'm gonna get my, my engine to vibrate at not only the RPM frequency, it's going to vibrate at also twice the RPM frequency. So one way to eliminate this vibration is to make R really big. That is to have a small crank arm like this, and then a really long, a really long uh, connecting rod like that. And then that reduces the higher, the higher harmonics and the higher vibration frequencies. Um, there are other tricks to eliminate uh, certain vibrations. That is to go to multi-piston, uh, multi-piston arrangements. Oops. And now I'm wondering if that's what's on my last slide that I wanted to talk about. Let's just see. Yeah, actually that's the explanation. So here's the primary term of the inertia force or the acceleration. The secondary term goes like one over L or one over big R. And so one way to cancel it is to increase the connecting rod length to have really long connecting rods that in, that introduces other problems. I mean, A, it makes your engine really like tall. And so it's harder to fit it inside of the inside of the package, inside of the vehicle itself. Um, let's see, there's another way and it's to actually, uh, it's to package pistons uh, or it's to package pistons together. So there's a way to completely eliminate these higher, or at least the, the second higher harmonic for inline sixes and inline eights. So that is six, that's an engine with, um, let me just try it. So an engine with six pistons in a row. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. And the inline six is one of the favorites of the American muscle cars in the sixties and the seventies because it wouldn't vibrate as much. So our pistons are in here. So it turns out if you stack six pistons in line, so actually six or eight, you can add an extra, you can add an extra two pistons there and still be able to cancel some of the higher harmonics. Um, and then you can take those sixes and you can put them, so you can take two inline six engines and put them at an angle 
with respect to each other like this. So you have six pistons along this row, six pistons along this row, that's a V12. If you do eight and eight, that's a V16 engine. And that also has, this is one of the reasons why you saw a lot of V engines, those V12s uh, in larger cars all the way throughout up until, um, actually up until today, but up until relatively recently is that you could cancel a lot of the, or it was, it's one of the added benefits of using such engines that you can cancel out a lot of the uh, acceleration forces. And that summarizes, so that closes our exploration of um, the physical geometry of engines.